Hey everyone, this is Fide Master Kosti Kavitsky here for chess.com and today I'm going to be doing a video on one of the greatest attacking and most imaginative players uh, of all time, Grandmaster Alexei Shirov. So Shirov, who uh, was born and grew up in Latvia, is very well known today as being a sharp and tactical genius. And the reason for this is that he grew up studying with uh, former world champion Mikhail Tal, who is widely regarded as probably the greatest attacking player of all time. Uh, definitely the most imaginative. And by studying with him as a youth, Shirov developed his own uh, unbelievable powers. And in 1990, at the age of 18, he achieved the Grandmaster title. So since then, he's won a bunch of super tournaments, and generally for the last 20 years, he has been over 2,700. And to start off, we can take a look at the position you have on the screen. And this came from a semi-slav defense. In this position, black played e6, e3, knight bd7, queen c2, bishop d6. In this position, most everyone played either bishop e2, bishop d3, or b3, and sort of a slow game developed, with white having slightly more space, and so on and so forth. But in this position, Shirov, along with another Latvian grandmaster, Alex Shabalov, who's actually now one of the strongest players in the United States, came up with a incredible and very interesting pawn sacrifice that led to hundreds and hundreds of exciting games played in this opening, which was generally thought of as something slow and positional. And these two grandmasters, Shirov and Trebalov, came up with this move G4 in this position, which at first glance looks absolutely crazy. I mean, White is not developing his pieces, not fighting for the center, but this Move is very typical of Shirov style, attacking, aggressive, and very sharp. And the point of this move is that White just wants to play g5 and attack this knight on f6, and eventually when Black castles kingside, to have a ready-made attack based on the advance of this g-pawn. And it's a pawn sacrifice, the idea being after knight takes g4, White plays rook g1, and get some attacking chances based on the open G file. And a lot of crazy positions ensue after something like if F5, then H3, or if Knight takes H2, then we trade and play Rook takes G7. And as you can see, a very unclear and imbalanced position occurs, which of course Alexei Shirov is an absolute master of. He does very well in sharp and unbalanced positions because he has such a high tactical level and very good understanding of dynamic imbalances. Really, really advanced topic. So now I want to show a middle game that Shirov played where you'll really be able to see uh, how strong he was in very unbalanced and sharp positions. And this game took place in 1990. The opening here was a King's Indian defense where White also decided to fianchetto the King Bishop. And in this position, Shirov played the move Rook B8. So the point of this move is very clear. Black just wants to play B5, open some lines on the Queen side, and start to generate counterplay. Very logical stuff. So White played Knight D5. Now B5. White took on f6, and Shirov captures with the pawn. Taking with the bishop will leave the h6 pawn hanging, so e takes f6 is necessary. And these doubled pawns look weird, but after f5, the black bishop will be opened up, and this mass on the king side might help black generate some attacking chances later on. So now c takes b5, and rook takes b5. Very typical for Shirov style and also for this opening. Taking with the pawn looks better aesthetically because your pawn structure doesn't become as weak. 
here the a6 pawn becomes isolated and and quite vulnerable but the advantages of taking with the rook is now this rook is very active along the b file and even along the fifth rank one of the basic principles in Sharoff's play is that he prefers peace activity over the strength of his pawn structure which is very interesting now queen d2 g5 d5 knight e7 knight d4 so white is also playing very actively he gained a lot of space with this move d5 and now he wants to control the entire board using the light squares and his space advantage and in this position comes Shirov's first sacrifice rook takes d5 and what's interesting is that uh, Shirov wrote about this game in, in his first book fire on board and he wrote that the sacrifice is absolutely forced which a lot of players will probably find surprising I think a lot of people just move their rook back without too much thought but no Shirov believes that taking this pawn is absolutely forced as moving the rook back according to him would be a sign of impotence and I think from just from that you can kind of see what kind of player he is he believes in being very aggressive and and not backing down from anything so he sacrifices the exchange and what he gets is he wins white's strong d pawn and he also wins white's powerful light squared bishop after which his light squared bishop becomes very strong so knight f5 was played and he took white takes here and he takes on h3 and rook fd1 so the point of white giving up this pawn on h3 was that he was able to trade off black's strong knight on d5 which was threatening to take this very important dark scored bishop so this move was very logical even though it gives up a pawn white eliminates one of black's strong pieces and now it seems like white is getting very good play with his rook his rooks are both coming to open files and it looks like black isn't going to survive long white with his extra material is just going to start taking these weak pawns on the queen side and eventually win the game now black plays rook e8 rook c1 f5 preparing to possibly launch an attack on the king side and you often see this in Shirov's games he just sacrifices material and then the game continues Right, a lot of times people think of sacrifices as you sacrifice something and then you immediately have to go for checkmate. But that's not what's going on here. This is very much a positional exchange sacrifice. Black sacrifices rook to get control over the light squares and to fight against white's space advantage. Now black has plenty of space and very active pieces. And this is sort of a long-term compensation for white's extra material. Now I played rook d2. And here comes the second sacrifice of the game, which when I first saw it, I was playing through this game while reading his book. I was uh, I was really blown away at how uh, how incredible this idea was. So Sharov played rook takes e3, sacrificing his second rook for White's dark squared bishop. And now after the recapture on e3, queen e7, we get a very very complicated position which is of course perfect for Shirov's style and when I first saw this game I really didn't understand what was going on how could black play this way just sacrificing both of his rooks for two pieces I mean I just didn't really see what he was getting and then after analyzing a little bit I realized that black's compensation here is very very good by giving up his two rooks he gets Okay, two very powerful bishops, which have many wonderful diagonals to work with. You know, this bishop can come to e5. This bishop is controlling all the light squares around white's king. And next, the pawns around white's king are completely destroyed and weak. You know, right now, black is already threatening to take on e3, and the g3 pawn is very weak. And if white loses these pawns and black's queen gets into the attack... Well, the bishops are going to be no weaker than the rooks on a completely open board. Right? What's next is that Black's king is completely safe. He's completely protected by his pawns and his dark scored bishop. And by the time that white can activate his rooks and possibly take some of these queenside pawns, Shirov will already be able to launch a decisive attack. 
So when going for these positions with very unbalanced material counts, in this case, black has two bishops and two pawns versus two rooks. What you have to try to evaluate, other than just counting the points of each piece, is the dynamic potential. Which side can create threats? Which side can attack the king? And in this case, it is clear that black is the one who's holding the initiative, which is very, very important. And of course, Shirov was great at handling the initiative. He has lots of amazing attacking games. So king f2 was played. Now bishop e5. And black is ready to start pushing his pawns on the king's side and open up the white king and trying to launch a decisive attack with his queen and two bishops. Rook h1. And now the third and final sacrifice, which ultimately wins him the game. And Chirov here played bishop takes g3 check. And when I saw this move, I was absolutely blown away. But of course, at this point, this is this position is really all about calculation, calculating very accurately. And this isn't another positional sacrifice. This is definitely a tactical sacrifice. And after calculating, sure, I've realized that after white takes and queen takes e3 check, he's getting a very dangerous attack. So now if king h2, black can win immediately with queen f2 check and g4 mate. So white is forced to play queen f3. Now queen takes d2. And white gives this check and plays king takes h3. And now queen takes e2. So Shirov saw this position in his calculations before playing bishop takes g3 check, sacrificing the bishop, and saw that he's going to get five pawns for white's rook. But more importantly, the white king is going to end up completely exposed and it's going to be very difficult for white to defend himself against black's queen and these pawns here which are ready to enter the attack. So white play queen d5, king g6, queen d4, f4. White cannot create any threats with his queen and his rook because they're simply not coordinated. The black queen is too strong. And now already white has to deal with things like g4 check and queen f3 check followed by queen g3 mate. And this position is very, very difficult for white. So rook g1, f5, and black now just has too many threats for white to deal with. The main one is simply g4 check followed by queen h2 mate. And this move, queen takes f4, taking advantage of the pin on the g-file doesn't work because of queen h5 check. And the king has to move to the g-file, blocking his rook, and black can simply win this queen. So in this position, white decided to resign as he simply couldn't find a good defense to black's threat of g4 check. And looking at it, I don't see a defense here, and I don't think at this point white can really save his position. You know, again, rook h1 would simply be met with queen f3 check followed by queen g3 mate. I think after this game, I really understood the genius inside of Shirov is that he just has this unbelievable understanding of dynamic potential. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you around on chess.com.